My name is Kaelin. I'm from El Dorado Park Extension 4. I am the founder of KFI Connect. I'm also an AI engineer, software developer, IoT developer, and solutions architect. Why do I do what I do? So if we look at the world around us, especially during COVID, I think this has accelerated that one of the most important things is digitalization where everything that we do and are is online. So I do what I do in a sense, if I could steal this from Facebook, to bring people closer. Software brings people closer, enabling people to be live digitally, enables people to be closer to each other. And I also do this because to a certain extent, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with technology. I'm obsessed with adding value to people's lives. And software enables me to do that. So initially when I started, I wanted to do anything medical related. So I was more interested in biotech. And after some time, when I sat down with myself, I wrote down, I have a journal that I've been writing down since the age of 17. So around the age of 18, I wrote down three things that I think was important. That is, number one is energy, uh, health, and education. Once we get energy, health, and education right, I believe that our standard of living becomes better. So the one thing that can be incorporated in all three is IT and computer science, especially during COVID. I was raised by my grandparents and my mother, a single parent, so I've seen people struggle a lot in life and I did not want that type of life. I couldn't or I cannot be part of, how can I say, uh, enabling people to struggle or allowing people to struggle at a certain extent. So initially, what I, when I started doing this, it was to better myself and to better the situation of people around me. And also I wanted boys from El Dorado Park, boys in my street to have a different look. Because usually we look up to people that get into gangs and are somewhat clever. But really I wanted to do something different. So going to varsity, graduating, uh, obtaining certain certifications and then starting the business, having a stable job. These things enabled me to be a better example to not just myself, my little brother, but to everyone around me. So how could I or how did I avoid the trap of falling into gangsterism or anything that is labeled with boys from El Dorado Park? The first thing I would say is discipline. And a place that brought me a lot of discipline was the church. Because when you participate in the church or you become active in church, one of the things is when you go through the Bible and you connect to God, one of the things that you will definitely come across is God tells you what to do and what not to do. So that type of discipline is needed when you are tempted and you feel like you should be doing something but choose not to. So in that sense, I think church helped me a lot in staying disciplined and following the right track and building the right mindset. So if you look at bio biology, and uh, just how your brain is structured. There is a specific organ in your brain which is there for discipline and the more you practice discipline, the more this organ is increased or like muscle, it's increased and you are better suited when you are in situations where you are tempted to do things and not to do things. So when you are going or advancing in your career, there's something that you need to realize. More often than not, what people find in the working space is that you are undervalued and you feel like you can add more to the company, but you are not being paid for it. I know that's a big thing with many people where they want to move companies or change companies because they are not being paid enough or because they feel they are not adding anything to it. And my suggestion to people who are in those type of situations, try and stick it out as much as you can until a certain point where you realize, you know what, this is inevitable, uh, it's no longer going to work out for me, I think then it's a good place. Sometimes it's not a good place to walk away, sometimes it is. You just need to assess the situation. I can't exactly give someone advice and say, this always works because one shoe doesn't always fit another. So what could work for me might not necessarily work for you. But my advice is analyze the situation, 
see what is the best thing to do. And sometimes the best thing to do is the hardest thing to do. So you might have to sacrifice what you really want at this moment for a more longer or a later set satisfaction in the goal that you are chasing or what you are trying to get to. I am a founder of a company called KFI Connect and we specialize in four areas in IT development, which is architecture, web development, app development, and also in data. So when I speak about data, it means like CLC, MTN, what you use to access the internet or your currency on the internet. So initially the idea started, before I get into how the idea started, I want to say that I am big on physics. So I like physics a lot. And then there's the computer science aspect to the business as well. So initially the idea was that we found a way that you can get a light bulb to act as a router, right? So it has to be a LED light, a LED light bulb, which then releases electromagnetics and that can be translated into binary, which is how you can get a normal light bulb to act as a router. So that was the initial idea when we started the business and our motto was that every light bulb should be a router. And this is much safer than the internet, much faster than the internet. When I mean internet, I mean wireless connection, Wi-Fi. So that's where KFI comes from. So yeah. And then also, what is AI? AI is artificial intelligence. It's just the art of teaching or machine learning. So you are learning or teaching a machine how to do human processes. The same process thought that you would take to let's say complete a task, you are now just training a computer to do it. And the thing with this is it is more sufficient and most companies are like pledging large funds of money into this because they are saving long term more money. So for instance, I worked on an application with four other engineers that allowed systems administrators to do their work. So if you had five, six, seven years of knowledge and you would obviously perform a task better than someone who, did it, who has been doing what you're doing for one year. So what we've done is we put together a AI machine, an automated machine that allows people access to that six, seven years of knowledge with just one click of a button. It makes our lives easier and it enables us to be better as people. I think we're living in a generation of comfort and I think AI is the highest source of comfort for us at this moment. So what is the process behind building an application? So most people just assume that it is coding something, packaging it and then putting it on Apple Store or Google Play Store and then after some time you're making millions of rands off of it. That's not necessarily the case. So what really happens is there is several processes that you need to take and there is several people that needs to do the application. It is impossible for a one man to build the app specifically. Let's start with the first step. So usually what I do when I'm into IT architecture or I'm doing the architecture for an application, the first thing that you need to do is check, they call it the back end, which is the database. This is where your information is stored. You don't want someone to press one on a button and then when it pops up on the screen, it shows two. So data integrity is the first thing we need to check. You need to show, make sure that your data is a reliable source and it is viable. So that's the first step we need to take. The second step is then an integration between the data, right? And then what the people are seeing, which is your interface. This is your front end, right? So you need back end developers. You can need a front end developer and then an API if it's a web application to carry the messages in between. So usually it would be if I click A, it goes into the system, the system checks the database, it searches for A, A is this, and then it responds to what A is. Okay, that's the first step. And after you have built your application, you need to package it. So you need to package it in a certain way that this app should be allowed on this application and it should be allowed on this type of platform. And after it has been packaged, right, you are then, you're going to have to deploy it to a server. And once you have the server set up, you need to make sure that the security around it is tight. You need security always, you're going to need network because you're going to have traffic coming in and you're going to have to go through a lot of what we call QA, quality assurance. So this is something I do is called stress testing. 
uh, if an application has a certain amount of users accessing it, if an application has a certain amount of traffic coming into it, what do you do in that specific case? And also, I think something that you shouldn't do when you walk up to a developer is say, can you build something like Facebook for me? So don't do anything like that. It, it varies from one person to the next. What languages are we comfortable? Uh, I'm good with C Sharp. So C Sharp is mostly for desktop applications, your, for Windows specifically. And then you get other like Java, Python, which are object oriented and you can code them for any specific object. And then you have Swift if you're doing iOS development, Flutter and JavaScript. So those are just a few languages that we use to code. So not just any developer can develop anything. It's custom to your skill set, which languages you are comfortable with. So if you are not technologically inclined, are you in danger? I would say 100% yes, you are. With the rise of AI, and people, I've heard this often, people say to me, uh, you've done AI and these type of things. Are you not afraid that it might take people's jobs? And the thing is, it's taking jobs which are redundant, things that are repetitive, things that are low skill. You don't need a lot of cognitive ability to do it. So if you're not technically inclined, I think firstly, if you're gonna run a business with COVID, uh, there were all physical shops were closed and all shops went online. So if you don't know how to maneuver the internet, you're in trouble, your business is in trouble. As a marketer, if you want to do marketing, you, we no longer see much billboards going up. We don't see so much ads on the TV. What we now see is Instagram, Facebook. How many times do you spend on your phone and how many times do you spend on the TV or looking at the billboard? Your answer is your phone mostly. So most things are directed to your phone. Most companies are directed to your phone. If you look at big tech companies, for example, what they are doing at the moment, if you have ex ever accessed the website and it says accept cookies, cookies are something they use to track you. So they track your movement, which sites you visit. And I know this has happened to you. Uh, it, it happens to me always when you speaking about something and all of a sudden you go into a site and all the ads you see are around that specific thing. That's AI, that's algorithm, something in AI we call algorithms. And the algorithms are trying to lure you in and they like, see you liking this, so go here, go here. Everything that you are speaking about. So if you are not tech savvy, I think you're gonna be in danger. And if you're looking for a job, I think basic skills that you're gonna need is how to maneuver a computer, how to maneuver the internet. And the most powerful tool on the internet is Google. There's nothing you cannot Google. Uh, myself as an engineer, as an architect, 80% of the time I'm Googling. There's nothing that I've built that hasn't been on Google. So you need to learn about technology and you need to learn about the digital platforms. You need to learn about tech. It's very important. We at a beginning of a very important stage in our human evolution. So now when I'm speaking about evolution, I'm not necessarily speaking about Darwin from the monkey up until uh, the Homo sapiens. If you look at the 1980s, computers were invented and they became common in the households. And then 1990s, we go to the internet being founded and the internet being a big thing. And then in your 2000s, we get the electronics where the iPods are coming out, cell phones are becoming a more common thing that we see and then now in our generation in our time we have the rise of AI. AI is going to be such a big thing and Web3, the metaverse, all these type of things are important for where society is going. If we look at, I'm going to speak first from a biological standpoint, right? We have so many errors on the human body. We have so many errors on this physical body, it, it disintegrates so quickly. And, and this is something that's so strange to me. At 18, when I started writing my journal on what I should do, and initially I said that I would like to have gone into biotech. That was my uh, initial love for technology and biology. So I wanted to do that. But then at that time, when I was writing down my goals and I was dotting down my journals, it seemed a bit silly at the time where I wrote about uh, humanoids, which is a combination of machine and your being. So what it happens is if you look at people now where your limb is off and then technology 
now enables us. It's such a beautiful thing. It's, it enables us where we can take your leg, an artificial leg, place it to your limb, and it functions the same as something that should be there, that should be there biologically. That's how far technology has gone. Technology has also connected us. If we look at during lockdown, if you video call someone, it is as if they are there. If you show that to someone 100 years ago, they wouldn't believe you, right? So this is what technology has enabled us to do and what it is still enabling us to do. Something that's going to be very big in the future on technology is the metaverse. This is made up of a VR virtual reality. If you think of it, at this point we are already, how can I say, one with machine where we are constantly on our phones. We are constantly on our phones. We always have devices, technological devices tracking us. So when you walk around, you always have your smartwatch, you have your smartphone, you have your smart TV, smart cars are coming out. Tesla has recently come out with the self-driving cars. So we'll keep on accelerating. And I think, in fact, COVID is a catalyst for technology advancing at a very rapid rate because now the need is arising for more technology technology to be integrated in our daily lives. So what we see is that everything is tech related. Every company essentially is a tech company. Every company needs to contribute to technology. And also something that's going to be very important for the future. If I speak on the metaverse, I'm speaking about what Facebook recently founded. Facebook rebranded the company name from Facebook to metaverse. So to Meta, Meta is the parent company for Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Mark Zecklenburg, obviously the owner of all of these companies. And something that we see is the metaverse, meta meaning not real verse. So kind of like you have the universe, which is real and it is everything that we see. The metaverse is a non-real verse. That's essentially what meta is. It's a non-physical world. And I think to some extent we're already living in it. I know a lot of people are, if you and I can agree to this, there are so many people that have Instagram lives or Facebook lives where their Instagram or Facebook life doesn't necessarily reflect the reality of their life. So you're living in this meta world, this meta social media world. And that essentially what metaverse is enabling us to do and through NFTs, you are now able to live in a world where it is not real. You are living in a place that it's not real, but it's fun. And I think this is part of our evolutionary process that we need to adapt and we are going to move quicker to that. For us, it might be something that's taboo and like far off. But in the coming years, it's something that's going to be very big. If you look at NFTs and how all of a sudden you have people making millions of rands off of NFTs, on the internet, someone just created something and now all of a sudden NFTs is blowing. Metaverse hasn't officially, how can I say, launched and is like global to everyone, but they slowly phasing it in. So what happens in the metaverse is I am able to purchase a avatar or a specific uh, NFT and that is my image or my face or whatever I am and even property on the metaverse where people are now buying land that's not actually real music is being sold on the nft as a non-fundable token so there's so many things happening to us and i think inevitably the last step of of what we know now and i think in about 20 to 30 years we'll see it is that we're living in a world where we are one with the metaverse or we are one with technology. I think it's something that people are starting to entertain the idea that we need more technology. We need to be more, how can I say, uh, there needs to be a stronger union between us and technology. That's essentially what's happening to us at the moment. Technology is advancing and growing at the rate that we cannot imagine. Everything about society or previous societies, how in the past people have set up systems, how currency is being monitored, how, how can I say retail, how rentals are working, how property is working, everything about our world is being changed daily by the power of social media. And something that you would notice is that 
So many people now have the power to influence thousands of people without even having certain, how can I say, criteria being met or certain standards. You, If you are sitting on your phone and you have a thousand people following you, the influence that you have, it is unbelievable that you can influence a thousand people with just a click of a button. Just something, just one opinion and then you can set off a whole forest on fire. That's the power of technology. That's what and technology has enabled us to do. Previous, throughout the years, this wasn't always there. And if you look at the metaverse, it is coming and it's here to stay. And if you're not jumping on the bandwagon, I think you're going to fall behind and you're going to look and say, if only, what could be, what should be, why didn't I? I think by all means necessary. If you look at the world today, stocks, prices are going up. And know what dictates stocks is data. What type of data are you using? Where do you get the data from? If you look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg was in Congress a few years ago about Facebook and Facebook leaking data and him speaking about how Facebook can influence elections and these type of things. That's the power that we have in our hands at the moment. So if you think about it with cryptocurrency coming out, I am on the metaverse, I'm on NFTs and I'm trading on these platforms. So if you see the metaverse, the metaverse is running with blockchain and it's there with cryptocurrency so we're no longer buying things with the rand and the dollar it's now everything crypto related so now the thing with crypto is that there's no tax on it and there's no paper trail on it so also to that aspect there's pros and cons so that brings in a criminal aspect government can't really uh how can i say check how compliant you are with taxes and these things bringing into cryptos and the metaverse and all these type of things but it's something that we can't avoid it's something that needs to happen i feel like for a certain amount of time we never really had struggle as a society and as a global community every generation is going through some sort of struggle or goes through some sort of struggle we never had any and then COVID comes and i think which is one of the most important things to us i feel like COVID. It's going to sound controversial and maybe a bit cold-hearted, but COVID is something that needed to happen for us to get to this stage, for us to get to the new set of technology, for us to advance in how we think, how we see the world and what we are doing. So, if I was you, people, it, it's, very, it's very weird that people are using, saying that the government is out to track us. And I've recently also done some research on cybersecurity for an assignment I had. And there is some law set in place that the government is allowed to check your data. The government is allowed to check your messages and these type of things. This was a law that was passed in the UK some years ago. So if they, can I say... Uh, have allegations or assume that you could be doing something illegal they are allowed to go to those type of extremes so if we are afraid that the metaverse is becoming part of our lives and the government is now starting to track us with COVID that's not really the case the case is these things have already, be, already have been set in place and that we can't avoid it and it needs to happen so if I was you if you are how can I say if you feel threatened that the metaverse is coming then you shouldn't be part of social media as a whole because the metaverse is just social media at another stage it is facebook whatsapp uh instagram on steroids this is the mother of facebook this is where things are coming together it's going to be a very odd world and something how can i say that is going to be important to us during this time is seeing how can we mediate it how can we set rules, set things in place that this thing is in a controlled environment and things aren't spiraling out of control. It's a weird thing but it's happening where we are going to the metaverse and that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time. We're already doing it now with social media and I just think the metaverse is here to, how can I say, progress that idea. Okay, the following I'm going to say with a lot of controversy and I feel like many people are caught in the trap and it's a common phrase that I don't want to associate myself with and I feel like people use this phrase and as, as an excuse to not doing what they need to do so the phrase goes as this own race own pace to me that's not necessarily a absolute truth I feel like we all are in the same race 
and there's a certain standard by which things need to get done and you need to live up to that standard for example if you are going for an interview right there are four other candidates so if you're going at your own pace and you are short of the standard you are you're not going to get the job so if your own pace is under the standard you cannot be in a place where you feel you can become your best or that you can achieve your best so i would like to say this to people if you want to achieve any form of success you're going to have to be very competitive i feel like people aren't competitive enough people don't want to digging with their teeth people don't want to walk over other people they just want a walk in a park it should be all roses and we all singing kumbaya holding hands but that's not how the world works so i feel like if you want to obtain certain level of success this should be the standard by which the world is operating and you have to operate at this level so that is my encouragement to you whatever the process is find someone who is ahead of you find someone who you can be chasing and then learn from them and this is the tricky part people compare and that's where jealousy and envy comes in if you find a way to compare yourself to the next person without getting jealousy or envy involved i feel like you will obtain great success i feel like you will do so much more so don't just get caught in the trap of it's me i'm on my own it's my own pace i don't have to do as much you need to do way more because so many other people are going after what you after you're not the only one pursuing what you're pursuing there are 7 billion people on the world and we all in pursuit of something and if you're going to be an elite if you're going to function at the highest order your own pace necessarily is not going to be good enough you need to up your game you need to work at the highest standard your work rate needs to go up another example is this if you're in grade 12 to pass grade 12 you need 340s and 430s that's the standard if your own pace is just 20% you're going to fail and necessarily you're going to fail there is no way to sugarcoat it and i feel like it's being sugarcoated that you can do it at your own pace sometimes your own pace is not good enough most times it's not so you need to level up you need to stop making excuses and i feel like people use that as an excuse to not do what they need to do so they just okay they just accept it and that's it so if you're going to operate at a very high level you're going to have to up the standard of whatever you're doing you're going to have to try and outwork anyone else you're going to have to put in more hours than expected if they are asking you to do 5 do 8 if they are asking you to do 10 do 15 that's the only way you're standing out that's the only way you're getting the best i've never met a person that has said to me you know what i don't want to be the best no one has ever said i want to be second own race own pace allows you to be second fourth third whatever position It doesn't allow you to be first you have to commit you have to put your mind to it and saying i'm being the best and no one's going to outwork me no one's going to outsmart me i remember about 7 years ago i was on a gips program for grade 12s and then what they said to me was this this i wasn't really paying attention to the whole class but then they said these words to me and it still echoes to me every time i'm doing something some people are born smart others are born rich but work ethic levels the playing field so there are people who might not be as gifted as you are or as smart as you are don't have the type of resources that you have and they are doing way more but you're going at your own pace and it's your own race that's just an excuse that we are using there is a global standard by which we are operating there is a standard that you owe to yourself that you owe to humanity that you owe to god that you need to operate at and i feel like own race own pace doesn't necessarily conform or operate to that standard we need to see this is the standard and i am making sure i'm going higher i'm making sure i'm doing better than this if you adversity 50% is a pass personally i set myself to 65% if i get 65% in any varsity thing it's okay 50% for me at varsity is counted as a fail even though i'm passing the subject i'm to myself it's a fail so i'm always hard on myself when i'm judging myself but i'm also very good at appraising myself i give myself the pat on the shoulder and say you know what you're doing well and I also tell myself you know what you're not up to the standard we need to up this and i see efforts how can i make it so find someone who is in front of you sign find someone who you can chase attach yourself to that person compare yourself to that person 
without getting envious or jealous and I'm certain within no time you'll be operating at that person's space, you'll be op operating at that person's level and before you know it, when you add it yourself to what that person is doing, you're exceeding what your competition or whoever is competing with you is doing. So in short, trust the process.